All right, good. We need to um, cover quickly some pages out of Peeper on absolution, so I want to talk about that. And then we need to get into the uh, CT CTCR document, Lord's Supper, and that pretty much wraps up our discussion on sacraments. And so actually, technically, we should do absolution second, but I want to make sure I cover this, and so I'm going to do it first, and then we'll get into the Lord's Supper stuff, because that, that has the potential to, to um, devolve into a bunch of questions. Um, so we'll cover the absolution part first, because see, really, we should, well, yeah, that's what I said, didn't I? Devolve? I think I said that, didn't I? Yeah. Didn't I devolve it? I thought I did. All right. So um, we're supposed to do baptism, Lord's Supper, and then absolution, quasi, half sacrament, but we're going to do half sacrament first, okay? So that's what we're doing. All right. So with Peeper, the key, and he's on the right money with this. He says here in the outset, page 189, he says that, um, you know, this is uh, kind of an important thing to talk about because this really reveals kind of a lot of other things in theology, and I think he's right about that. So in other words, the whole question of absolution um, is kind of, a, a, kind of a, a challenging thing. And so we have the very first paragraph on 189 he writes, We shall discuss absolution in a separate section because this doctrine tests one's knowledge of Christianity. General use of such terms as gospel and reconciliation by Christ harbors much unclear thinking. Haziness reveals itself in the objections brought against absolution. Spot on. This, this is stuff that, this is kind of one of those areas where you really have a kind of a litmus test of do you get what's going on with theology and with the gospel. And the general absolution really reveals this, this idea on, on several fronts. And you're going to get this. You'll get people who come up and say, you know, Pastor, who are you to forgive sins? That's the job of only Christ himself. You know? And you just gave forgiveness to everybody. How do you know everybody's really repenting? You can't look in anybody's heart. Who, what do you mean you're forgiving everybody? Okay. Now, for a lot of people, they, those, those are like tough questions. Now, the first one really deals with ops, office of the ministry. And so that's an AC 14 kind of a thing, an AC 5 sort of a thing, that God has established a man in the office who speaks with the authority of Christ. So we'll cover that one more later another time. But the second question is what we're dealing with today. So you can't look in people's hearts. How do you know if they're really repentant? How can you say that they are forgiven? And what's the answer? Well, you read the 12 pages, so you should be ready with your answer. Take them at their word. You take them at their word, yes, and more than that, yeah. That they really are forgiven, regardless of... Why, Max? Because Christ died for forgiveness. When Christ died on the cross, for whose sins did he, whose sins were covered? Everyone. <laughs> See, that Buddhist, Buddhist popcorn does that to you, Adam. <laughs> Just get all messed up. <laughs> yes, Brian? So I had some of the popcorn, so if you... Oh, want you did too. Feel, okay. feel free to critique me. I mean, the, the, the pastor says in the private confession and absolution, do you believe that these words are not my own but God's, right? Right. And so... That's right. I'm asking, now we're back to the who's, got, who's authorized to do this, the AC5 guy, the absolution man, me, the pastor in this place, by God's call, I'm the one who's speaking to you with the authority of God himself. So that's covered that. Now, do you have to be able to look in somebody's heart and know if they're really repentant to, to announce the forgiveness of sins to them? Well, on two levels, no, you can't because none of us get to look in hearts. On the second level, it doesn't matter. Now, this is the, really the crux of this whole discussion. And this is what's really driving this whole thing. And that's why Peter says this is kind of the acid test. Because if you understand what the gospel is about, the gospel means that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for the sins of the entire world. Who in creation was reconciled with God at Christ's death? The answer is everyone. Everyone has been covered. Now, does everyone receive the benefits? Of course not. So now we're back to that nice distinction we've been dealing with all through the sacraments, the difference between efficacy and benefits. And so in a sense, when you declare the absolution of sins, you are making an efficacious statement. Just like when you give the body and blood, who's getting the body and blood of Christ? Every single person that's taking it into their mouth. Everyone. What if they really don't believe? Doesn't matter. It's still there. Now, the same kind of thing is going with the absolution. I declare to you the forgiveness of your sins. Your sins are indeed forgiven. What if I'm not really repentant? Well, then you get no benefit. 
Your sins were paid for, but if you in your stupidity and in your unbelief and in your resistance to the work of the Holy Spirit refuse to receive the gift He has, either through your impenitence or your disbelief in God's forgiveness or your disbelief in God, then you receive none of the benefits, even though it's still true that your sins have indeed been paid for. Okay? Now that's the nitty-gritty theology going on here. So that's why you can stand up in front of a congregation and without batting an eye and say, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins. You have been, been forgiven. God himself has done it in Christ. Your sins are covered. It's true, right? And you see, that's also why if you're a Calvinist, you can't do that. You get that? Because they have the tulip. You know your Calvinist theology a little bit, right? Tulip is the L. Yeah, total depravity, unconditional election. L is limited atonement. All right? So whose sins were paid for? The elect. Who's the elect? God knows. So I would have to stand in front of the congregation and say, to those of you who are the elect of God, your sins are forgiven. They were paid for in Christ. Um, the rest of you, not so much. Where do you fall? Ah, that's, the, that's the question, of course. And I have no answer for you. I hope you and your heart have some sort of answer, but you know you can't even trust that, really, can you? So, good luck everyone, you're on your own. Happy absolution. There's no absolution. They can't do it. And so it can rightly be argued that a true, real deal Calvinist can't absolve sins. Can't do it. You, earlier, talking about the benefit of absolution, you tied both faith and repentance <clears throat> To the benefit is that is faith and repentance the same thing in this case, or is it two separate things? You have to have faith and oh, you have oh, to be no. I would say that see, faith is going to be recognizing God's reality, which is is the repentant heart. And in fact, if you're going to really start unpacking repentance, what is repentance? Repentance is the turning in your mind, and it's the turning to Christ. And so, the turning to Christ that's called faith. Exactly. And so repentance is the first step that leads to faith. And so in a sense, you could argue that repentance is a part of the creation of faith. And I would say that would be the right understanding of that. Okay, Jess. In one of the orders of uh, worship, we have that weird alternate absolution where it's, we say, um, to those who believe, um, I forget the exact wording, but yeah. it kind of sounds like there were put a qualifier on the education. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> What? He was my shill. No, actually, no. No, I, um, I, was, I was anticipating this because that's where I want to go now. Now, this is from Chemnitz from 1569. This is Chemnitz. And the reason we're going to talk about this is because this sparks a lively debate around here, and usually it starts to crop up in Lutheran mind. Because one of the things you do in Lutheran mind is the whole idea of, you know, forgiveness, boom, there it is. The absolution just declares it whenever you're forgiven because God said it. Remember that? You had that big discussion? All right. Now we have this. The Almighty God has been merciful to you. Now, this is the absolution part. The confession was before. And through the merit of the most holy suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, His beloved Son, He forgives you all your sins. And, as a, and I, as a called and ordained servant of the Christian church, proclaim to all you who truly repent and who through faith place your trust and minds on the merit of Jesus Christ and who order your lives according to the commands and will of God, the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On the contrary, however... I say to any impenitent and unbelieving, according to God's word and in his name, that God has held your sin against you, and this certainly is punished. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, the fact that Chemnitz's name and Andre's name up there makes you think twice before you dismiss this. At least it should. At least it should. And in fact, is this confession or is this absolution legit? Now, see, this is the big debate that rages around here. Because, see, the argument from Luther Mind would be, this is not an absolution. Because, see, an absolution is just a blanket, boom, there it is, done, grace, no conditions. And any condition steals the absolution, it's not an absolution. Now you got Chemnitz doing this deal. What's going on? Does this sound scripturally accurate? Does to me. Luke? It's not a different absolution, it's just a more complanatory you know, absolution. I think that's on the right track here. Coleman. Um, this also sounds like it's a, a corporate thing. I'm getting, wondering, my question is what's the difference between the individual and the corporate? Huge difference. Okay. okay. 
and that we're going to talk about. It. And that's kind of where I'm going with this part of this, this whole discussion, okay? This was intended as part of the general absolution. Now, most of us grew up in a church where we were doing well, I grew up with TLH, you guys grew up with LW or LSB, okay, or something akin to that. And we have been hearing, you know, confessions and absolutions our entire lives, and the general confession and absolution our whole lives. We're very used to it. But you need to realize that in the time of the Reformation, a general absolution was not universal. In fact, it was not practiced widely in a lot of places. It kind of came in slowly through different angles. There are different articles you can dig out on this kind of stuff. Tom Winger has one from 05 from some journal from Canada, from the Canadian Lutherans up there. And there are a few others you can dig into this if you're really interested in this. But the history is kind of interesting. Historically, confessions were not universally just generally part of the divine service. Why? Well, Coleman already put his finger on it. Because what was the expectation? private confession and absolution. Why have a general absolution when you got private confession going on? And if you got private confession happening, what do you mean general absolution? Now this is important to remember, because in the small catechism when Luther is talking about the office of the keys and confession, and he's talking about confession, what confession is he talking about? Private confession. Same with the large catechism. So when we take those words and apply them to the general confession, we're really kind of missing the boat. Because for Luther, he's assuming this is happening in private. This is private confession. That is the preferred, expected way the keys are going on. That's the way Luther assumes it's going to operate. That's his understanding. And so a general confession or absolution was considered an aberration or an addition to the private confession, never a substitute. And in fact, one of the reasons why there was resistance to a general absolution was because the fear was that it would phase out and overshadow the private confession. Huh. That couldn't happen, could it? And so it's, it's kind of fascinating historically with some of these things going on. So when the confessions came in, they came in a couple different places. One came in at the end of the sermon, right before the Lord's Supper, where after the sermon, the preaching was done, the pastor would kind of lead the congregation in a general confession because we're all aware of our sins now. And then there was no absolution spoken because what was the next thing that happened? Yeah, you came to the sacrament. And so you would confess and then you come to the sacrament. That was one place it came in. The other place it came in was especially in the city of Nuremberg, where you had um, Link was the pastor there. And he introduced this idea of a general confession because they had a problem with enough pastors to do enough private confessions. Not everybody was getting covered. And so there was the concern that since we don't all get private confession the way we should, people need to have the assurance of their forgiveness. So we're going to put it in as a general confession. And he started doing it. And the people kind of ate it up and really glommed on to this. Oziander, the same one that gave, gave trouble in FC3, didn't like it and was pushing against it and was appealing to the Wittenberg faculty to help sort it out. And they were kind of embroiled in this thing for a long while because the city council didn't like Oziander, Oziander didn't like them, and so they were going around and around on this thing. And that's where basically Luther and Melanchthon said, yeah, the general confession makes sense, but it should never overshadow private confession. And, you know, the idea of actually saying, you know, if you're not repentant, your sins aren't forgiven, is simply stating what's scriptural. And so Chemnitz is not that far out of whack. Now, in the context of thinking absolution is just declaration of gospel, boom, bold forgiveness of sins, true enough. So in that definition, this probably wouldn't qualify as an absolution. What it would qualify is, as is like a statement of God's judgment or something like that. You know, a declaration of God's reality. So you're not absolving as much as you're saying, here's the reality. And that's a little bit like the statement of grace you'll get, even in the divine service. You know, in LSB, you've got two columns. One with a little cross in it, one that doesn't. Right? On the confessions and the absolution. And most people assume, well, that's for the ordained guy. This one's for the vicar. Okay? You'll learn about that on Monday, if you haven't already. You have your last meeting, don't you? That's when you're told one more time, you're a student. Don't cause trouble. I just said it for you. Now you don't have to go to the meeting. Um, <clears throat> now, anyway, that's not why there's two columns. The two columns reflect these two different traditions, these different practices that were going on. Because the one is more of a absolution, I forgive you your sins, done, which is what you have here. I, as a called and servant, declare the forgiveness of sins to you. But then we have added on, who truly repent. Whoops. Now we just seems to mitigate it a little bit. Which is true, though, because those who are truly repentant, yeah, you're forgiven. And by the way, if you're not repentant, um, your sins are certainly retained. Isn't that the office of the keys? It is. It is clearly the office of the keys. So there's nothing up here that's heresy. There's nothing up here that's unscriptural. 
But it's not a bald word of forgiveness and absolution. That's quite true. And so if you're going to define absolution as 100% pure gospel bald forgiveness, then this doesn't cut it. It doesn't qualify. Does it qualify as a thing you might say after somebody's confessed their sins? I think so. And it's a little bit like the left-hand column in the divine service where it says, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And, you know, cool, we're all forgiven. And there's no, I forgive you, te absolvo. That's not there, because that was really kind of borrowed from the private confession. That's where that came from, you know, te absolvo, I absolve you. And that was the private confession kind of brought into a general thing. The other one's more of the sense of, God's got grace for all of you who are repentant. And this is cool. This is great. And they're both appropriate for an ordained man to use. It's not like, yeah, if you're not ordained, you've got to go for the other one. But really, an ordained guy wants to do the full blast one. No, they're both full blast declarations. This one has got a more pointed, I forgive you. Okay? Now, loose ends on this whole absolution confession thing. So, by, by the way, now, so next year on Vicarage, you'll do none of this because you're just going to do what you're told. But someday, is it appropriate for you to trot this baby out and use it in your divine service? I say yes. Now, some people might say, no, don't do that to your people. You're stealing the gospel. No, you're not. You're just teaching them. Now, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest maybe you just sprinkle this in once in a while. It just keeps people on their toes a little bit. You know, so you don't need to have like, I'm just going to always, always use this one because I don't like the other one. No, there's, there's appropriateness to the I forgive you, done, pure absolution. There's appropriateness for this as well. Just realize that you're not giving full blast gospel the way you might with an absolution. But there's a, there's a place for this. Just like there's even a place for, like Burson likes to do around here in Easter, no confession and absolution in the divine service. What? You have to have that to be Lutheran. What do you mean? No, you don't. That's one of those things I really hate when people have five requirements for a Lutheran service to be Lutheran. You know, and then they have these check things. You know, it's got to be an invocation, got to have God's word, got to be confession, Lord's Prayer, creed, and a sermon. And if those things are there, it's Lutheran. No, no, that's just stupid. There is no checklist. And I violate it all the time on purpose just to prove it. You know? Leave the creed out. Why not? Why not? Confession? No, not today. What? No. Don't need to do it. Coleman. Maybe going down a different route, I don't have to chase it, but the words of absolution and uh, what is actually stated in there, how do we, the, the hearer doesn't, we don't necessarily know that it's working as gospel. Correct. Right here. That's quite right. So, I mean, how? No, that's quite right. We, we are, believer delivering the gospel. But if you have actually a person who's there with an impenitent sin, and they know it, and they're guilty, eaten up over this, when I announce the absolution to him, it's probably going to just actually compound his guilt. Just like, and here's the parallel, just like the guy who comes to the Lord's Supper and eats and drinks unworthily, what's it doing to him? St. Paul says, compounding his guilt. So you see, there's a nice parallel here. And what's, what's really going on here, the consistent thing through all this is, I believe it's the fulfillment of Christ talking about, don't cast your pearls before swine. I think this is exactly what's going on. So, in other words, when the impenitent are being unduly fed gospel, it's like you're casting pearls before swine. That's why you don't intentionally do it, but it might happen inadvertently. And so the impenitent could actually hear an absolution which convicts them. All the more. And this is one more good lesson you should have learned in Luther Mind. The law gospel is not a matter of the words and analyzing who's doing the verbs. It's God? Okay, it's gospel. Oh, no, no. And that's why there's, I, I sometimes said when I, when I would teach Luther Mind, there is no CPH, Luther, a law gospel edition of the Bible coming out with words of law in red, gospel in blue. You know, how easy would that be? It can't work that way because you could have a blue word of gospel that can be heard as law to somebody. You, you don't have, you don't get to control that. We don't, and you know how this goes. You were taught that. And so the same thing goes here. That even an absolution, the most beautiful declaration of gospel, can end up being heard as law to an impenitent person. Does that answer right after? Okay, good. Yeah. Now, um, based on what you just said, even that last sentence, I, would, I <coughs> wanted to just play around with that a little bit. Um, sometimes, sometimes with, when working with some people, mm -hmm. you'll see when you pronounce... Uh, words of gospel, or even something like this, which is just both law and gospel, clearly, you know, you, it almost kind of separates oil from water in that moment where you can see an unrepentant sin because of this anger that begins to kind of boil up. 
there's truth to that. I mean, I mean, you can't. No, I know. know for sure, but, but you're into the world of psychology and subjectivity, and it's always a little bit, you know, harrowing to make the conclusions. But you are quite right in your pastoral practice. You're going to be able to see from people and how they respond to these things, and you can learn a lot about what's going on and give you clues on, you know, potential pastoral care you need to give. You're probably going to sense from that whether you need to do a little more investigating <clears throat> just to make sure. Yeah, that, uh, within reason. Yeah, I mean, you're not an investigator, but sure, you ask questions and you probe, and when what should be a word of gospel causes anger, uh, you wonder what's going on. Absolutely. Yes, I would agree with that. All right, but see, that's all P stuff, and I'm, I'm not oh, qualified okay. for that. Cause that's violating union rules. I'm an S guy only. All right. <clears throat> Good? Yes? How does uh, the, the pronouncing of absolution fit in with the whole uh, the, the, the oral proclamation type thing? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. I mean, that's, and that's why, because it's the oral proclamation, and that's why absolution really does rise to a sacramental level, in my opinion. Um, you can make the argument, and Kenneth even does in his Enchiridion, and he'll say, yeah, it's pretty close to a sacrament, but you're lacking this element of the earth, unless you consider the voice and the hand of the man who's absolving to be the element of the earth, and you've got that there, too. It's just that it's not quite the same. And so that's why I will jokingly say we have two and a half sacraments, but I'm kind of half serious about that. And I would say the, the oral proclamation to that person's ears, that's exactly what's going on here. You're the absolution man. That's what's happening. That's why it matters. Julian. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about, our, I mean, obviously we can do that. We can do the general pronouncement of, of absolution, which, but it sounds like what you're saying also is that... Um, for those who are impenitent, we really shouldn't because it's just going to compound their guilt. If we right. know somebody's impenitent, you don't announce the grace of God to them. Quite right. 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 So, so that's, that's, in a sense, that's like commuting somebody who you know shouldn't be at the rail. Right. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, or just, because we don't know who's necessarily going to be visiting there that right. Sunday or anything like that. That's part of the and argument. So, I mean. That's why this kind of fits, doesn't it? It, it does. It does. No, I'd agree. And see, that's why, and see, this gets... It's often kind of dismissed as, well, this is kind of weird. But actually, there's a pretty good case you can make for this in the practice of the church and in being a faithful, careful practitioner of the means of grace. And if you read Luther's kind of fuller treatment of this, yeah, you know, he, he liked the bald word of forgiveness, no doubt about it. Because, you know, Luther wants the gospel to be the gospel. But he actually, he concedes the need for, you know, pastoral care and discretion. And like you said, if you've got a lot of visitors on a Sunday, who knows where they are? You know, do I want to just give a blanket absolution? I might be more inclined to use something like this because this makes them realize, whoa, dude, you just retained my sins on me. Yeah, I did. And that might be exactly what they need to hear. And it's not gospel, but it is what they need to hear. A really big, because there's two halves of it, right? Like there's the, the retaining of sin, or the appearance of sins, but there's also the, the holding back. Absolutely. Right? That's part of the key, isn't it? And we're just kind of avoiding that whole second half. Yeah. We, we are not real keen on church discipline stuff. But that's, that's why I have an entire class period dedicated to it in Systems 4, which you'll never take. <laughs> but maybe we'll get the topic covered somewhere fourth year. I hope to. Coleman. Right, I'm going to be real Lutheran. But this, this, I, I feel... <laughs> but Systems 4 will be available for download for free. So you oh, can do, I'll that. watch it in my spare time. Now, next year you can do that. Sorry, Coleman, go ahead. I feel like we're trading on... Uh, uh, Arminianism is like that's, that's the pushback. You see, and this is the pushback. That's why it's not a clear absolution, and that's why, hey, don't do this, don't do this. But Chemnitz does. Cole Black's to trot this out in chapel once in a while just to stir everything up and get me people think about it a little bit. And Osiander was concerned, rightly, that, hey, you're going to diminish private confession, and you're taking away the reality that you need to be person who's conforming to Christ and following him, but see, then they have the danger of pietism comes in, too. And you're more concerned about pietism than you are Arminianism, because that's probably our biggest problem is the pietism says, you got to feel it, man. you got to be real about it. And this is one of the reasons why I even hate our confession and our LSB, frankly. You know, I sincerely repent of my sins. Ah, that's crushing. Sincerely? What do you mean, sincere? I, sincerity is a problem for me. You know, I, I, I have mixed motives on just about every level. And I think the more you realize yourself and the more honest you are in your self-examination the more you realize how mixed your motives are pure motives give me a break i'm a human i don't have a pure motive in my body and that's just the way we are so sincerely repenting is kind of scary i i'm just i'm already ruled out sincerely repent i'm trying but sincere i don't know 
hope I get forgiveness anyway. So I'm with you on this. I'm with you on the performative aspect, which seems to diminish the whole thing. And that's why I think, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly right practice to say, here's the absolution, it's just yours. It's in Christ. That's what the gospel is, and that's what the Lord's Supper is. But it's also right to say, we are responsible before God, and we can't play around with, with God's wrath, and we can't play around with grace. Paul's pretty clear on this. I mean, very clear on this. That's the whole church discipline thing that, you know, that Julian's bringing up. So you've got two sides to this thing, which are very real. And the side that says, don't monkey around with God's grace and don't cheapen it, I'm all over that. And you have the other side is, don't withhold God's grace. Pure gospel needs to be there for, for, for repentant sinners. Amen to that. So which one's right? Well, they both are. And the key is to make sure that you're not fueling kind of a self-righteous, pietistic move in the interiorizing, checking your motives, you know, how pure am I today? That's not helpful. But the other side is the kind of laissez-faire, cool, more grace, good. I'll get some more sin next week, so I'll be ready. You know? And does that happen in our circles? All right. And so to me, the, this is an area of pastoral care, of knowing what's kind of going on. Where are my people? What absolution do they need to hear this week? And maybe this week it's time for a little non-absolution word of law and a little rebuke. Maybe this week they just need to know who they are in Christ. And that's why I really think good practice is kind of Changing things around, using things that are a little different, not just kind of buy the book week after week after week, and just, especially if it's just one or the other full blast, which is kind of how we operate. I think it does fuel even some of my other concerns in other areas, which we'll be getting to next week um, at last, on the whole, you know, cheapening the Christian life and, you know, do we need to live a certain way? No, it's just grace. Well, that, the whole, this, you know, bald absolution certainly fuels that. I come here every week, what do I get? Forgiveness. What do I do in the week? In the meantime, who cares? Forgiveness is waiting for me, and I know it. And is it? Yeah. <laughs> but wait. So there's the tension. So what you're, what you're sensitive to the two is exactly right. And so the question is, where are you starting? Am I starting with a fear of causing people to despair? Or am I starting with a fear of causing people to become calloused and apathetic and just presuming upon God's grace? Both are dangers. Um, it's good to remember that the formula of Concord says that not only will a self-righteous works righteousness damn you, but so will what it calls an Epicurean delusion. In other words, I can do whatever the heck I want. God's got grace. And you got Voltaire's famous phrase, say, say son métier, it is his job. It's God's job to forgive. That's what God does. So I sin, God forgives, say son métier, it's his job. All right, Julian. This is probably more of a systems four question, but well, go um, ahead since you so, won't get it. So then, uh, I'm wondering about encouraging. Should you encourage congregants to do confession and absolution among themselves, or should you just point to yourself as the one who? Well, see, that's where, and this is the this is another sidebar kind of question. And now you're getting into the whole absolution man, office of the ministry kind of stuff between the office and the priesthood, which is a hot, lively debate in our midst, which in my opinion is easily solved by simply saying Christ gives his keys to the church, the church is the pastor and the people together. Who's got the keys? Both. Which one really has them? Both. Who has them first? Christ. And so, does the pastor get them from the people? No. Do the people get it from the pastor? No. The pastor gets them from Christ. People get them from Christ. So who's in charge? Thank you. All right. So, do the people have the keys? Can people give absolution to one another? Absolutely. And is the pastor's absolution better? No. It's more confidence producing, perhaps, because you've got the, as the called ordained servant, I'm wearing the vestments, I'm speaking for Christ. But when your wife absolves you for a sin you've committed against her and assures you of God's forgiveness, pretty powerful in her proprium. And that's one of the things we talk about. And that comes up there. Yeah, I mean, well, I have a question about who has the keys, but what should be our practice? Then? Yeah, what should be our practice is encouraging the full use of the keys on every level, as is appropriate. So, do I want a mother forgiving her five-year-old and saying, Jesus forgives you, and so do I? Absolutely, I want this. And do I want brothers in the dorm absolving one another when a brother confronts a brother and says, hey, idiot, dude, you were an idiot last night. You had way too much to drink. And you're, you're screwing up here. And he says, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I really messed up. I, I'm, I'm an idiot. Forgive him. Absolve him. Do it. You're his brother. It's appropriate for you to do that. We should be encouraging this. And that's not to diminish the role of the pastor, because the pastor has another kind of role as, I'm the man who is here by Christ, and I'll hear your confession, whatever you got to say, and I'm going to give you forgiveness. And when the guy forgiving you in your home doesn't enough, come and see me. 
we're going to double down on this thing. That's kind of your role. They're both appropriate. And one's not better than the other. They're both right in the right, in the right sphere. Is that making sense? And see, so in other words, you know, there's this tendency in our church body today to kind of, again, polarize one way or the other. Either become a defender of the priesthood at all costs and try to tear down the office of the ministry in the process, which is stupidity. That's what I lived with growing up in the late 70s and 80s. I saw plenty of that, and that was kind of taught to me. And so I push against that. But then the other side now is kind of doing the pendulum swing back the other direction of, hey, hey, I'm the guy with the black shirt and collar. I'm the one who forgives sins. You can't. Well, that's stupid, too, because... Priests have the ability to forgive sins, and this sense of only pastors can do the gospel is absolute nonsense. That's just clericalism, and that's not our church body, and that's not orthodox teaching, but it's out there, and I know that. Okay, so stay away from the extremes, guys. It's, it's about everything. You're going to hear Caberly tell you this in a few weeks, and he's even more authoritative than I am, but just stay away from the extremes, guys. The extremes are so tempting so tempting because you see people who are interesting and really captivating and say cool things and have catchy ways of doing things on the extremes and and they they have a way of rallying people around them and frankly life on the extremes is easy it's just easy because you just identify with your little in group and everybody else is wrong and you just snipe at everybody else and it's easy if they're not me they're wrong it's that's, that's simple and so you just you know, circle the wagons, laugh and yuck it up with your pals and, you know, crap on everybody else. That's how it operates. It's simple. But to say, no, I'm going to live in the middle and function where God wants me to function and not be polarized either way, that's, that's the challenging thing. That's the thing that gets tough. And that's where I want you guys to stay. Stay in the tough spot. All right, good. Anything else on the absolution part then? So, an absolution is never based on what I do. It's based on what God has done. That's why I can do a blank, blanket absolution. But it doesn't negate the reality that we are held accountable and responsible for our lives. That's also true. All right. Good, 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 good. Yeah. All right. All right. Moving on. So, now let's wrap up the Lord's Supper. So, the last thing to wrap up on Lord's Supper is this discussion about admission to the Lord's Supper. And I had you read the CTCR document from 99, a beast of a document, 60, how many pages in this one? 65, yeah, sorry about that. No, 58 is all. It's, a, it's just 58. 58. I don't feel so bad. All right, so what did you think of the CTCR document? Coleman. I have just a question. How do... How do some people in our church body advocate for infant communion? How do they advocate for infant communion? After reading this, and particularly the, I mean, the three bullet points they hit: discern the body is this. I know. Discern the body is this. Discern the body. Well, to me, um, I'll put it this way: I think the those who are advocate for infant communion are doing it pre not because of doctrinal reasons, but because of liturgical reasons. And so they have a strong affinity towards the East, and they think it's, they're kind of attracted to all their liturgical stuff from the East, and they like the idea of what the East does, and so the East does the infant communion, hey, we should too. And this is a good example of letting John 6 determine your theology. Unless you eat the body and blood of Christ, you have no life in me. <laughs> Give it to them. And you see, now you're taking John 6 and making it definitive for your theology, which it shouldn't be for your Eucharistic theology. That's a mistake. And that's a great example of that, because John 6 should not be applied that way. What should be applied is the clear teaching in 1 Corinthians, which says a man needs to examine himself. And if he can't recognize the body and blood of Christ, he shouldn't be communing. Well, okay, that's pretty straightforward. So can an infant do that examination? No. So that's why we don't commune infants. And I would say the same goes on the other end of life. I had a parishioner one time who wanted me to commune his wife who was in a vegetative state being fed through an NG tube. And he wanted me to give her communion through the tube. He said, oh, I can do it. We can crush it up and get it in there. I said, um, she's not aware of what's going on. Oh, no. Then there's no point. You know, this is not like it's magic food we're giving her that's going to, oh, zap her spiritual grace. It, there's no benefit to her if she's not realizing what's going on. Yeah, she's getting the body and blood of Christ, but it's not. It's magic. It's not like she's going to give her a new shot of faith or something. She, she's God's regardless of her comatose state or her vegetative state. And she doesn't need this. And that's actually keeping the sacrament and kind of diminishing it because we're creating a false understanding of its magic behavior or something. 
So I think it fits on both ends. The discerning needs to be there. And this, this is uh, the principle that you apply across the board. So what about somebody who's got special needs? You know, well, the question is, how, how special are those needs? How much can they discern? And if you have the conversation with the kid and he says, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and I know it, when I drink this wine and eat this little bit of bread, Jesus is coming to me and I have his own, his own self with me, I'll commune him. You know, I don't, he doesn't need to know much more than that. That's enough as far as I'm concerned. And that they have a sense of their moral responsibility, you know. I'm fine with that. So on that standard, how old should a kid be before we start First Communion? Pretty young. And so, you know, our, and this is, we are, we're moving in the right direction in our church body by finally decoupling First Communion from Confirmation. We're, we're getting there finally, and that's happening, even though some churches are slow to do this, because Confirmation and Communion have nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do with each other. And so we're decoupling that. That's good. But even moving it back to like fifth grade is kind of arbitrarily chosen. I don't know why. I don't get it. You know, if I'm going to start thinking about First Communion, if, if I had my druthers, it'd be basically be when a child is able to confess Christ as Lord and Savior and receive the sacrament in an appropriate way, recognizing this is Christ himself coming to me, I'm ready to commune him. And so I'm thinking pretty young, you know, six, seven years old for a lot of kids probably. Some kids, they're 18, they're not ready. But that's another case. Yeah, Brian. I, I was, uh, had trouble trying to understand when, when the document was talking about uh, how St. Paul um, did, uh, barring, barring from um, giving people the sacrament by the CTCR said, by teaching them. And like, it, it, like pastors shouldn't just bar people from the sacrament. Yeah. Right? They should, they, should, yeah. they should teach them and, and raise them up in a correct understanding. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Wrong and stuff. And in my head, I was like, well, depends. they're not doing that and still giving them the sacrament. They're it still depends. not giving. Yeah, like, so it what's depends. the difference? All right, it depends. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the CTC, okay, let's, this is the first time I've had you read a CTCR document, isn't it? No? no? Did I have, what else did I have you read? Oh, the inspiration one. Okay, all right, all right. So, oh, that's right. Tons of them, I forget. All right. So now you know that. So did I? Did I give you my CTCR speech then? I don't. You know, they're varying documents. You know, the, the quality is varying, and they're always trying to. This is this is theology by committee. Okay, and so you have theology by committee, which is trying to cover all the bases, and make sure everybody's happy. And so what they're concerned about is some people are concerned about. You know, clerical tyranny, and we don't want that to happen. And so that's what they're. Trying, that's why they put that in there. And so you're trying to cover all the bases and trying to make sure. Yeah, I know, because that, that's a serious concern among some people. And so that's why it, it makes its appearance. And the CTCR then reflects whoever's on the committee and what their driving concerns are, and they insist on things getting put into the document. That's kind of how it works. Um, my experience with CTCR documents also is they have a tendency to be, um, they, they'll open up a topic, explore it, and you get all done, and you close your book and say, oh, cool, status quo is exactly right. And they, they have this way of kind of affirming this is what we've been doing. We're all just fine. And so it's all good. And so the status quo just gets propped up one more time. It's pretty typical. Uh, I had a question about uh, with the part where they go uh, through verses 17 through 34 of 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. 11. And uh, I guess after reading it, uh, they, they, there's several assertions that Paul was assuming that uh, that where Paul was directly talking about the sacrament, mm -hmm. but based on how they're structuring their argument, it seems to me more like they're assuming that versus, and I recognize that kind of sounds very Lutheran of me. Mm -hmm. I, it does, but I, I'm just trying to see where. No, you're really you're trying from. you're trying to read it through the right way now. All right, so I don't want to get caught in the weeds on this thing, and I'll, I'll be real upfront with you and tell you I'm not going to get into the exegetical side of this argument, which is basically what this document's mostly doing. So about the first 40 pages is unpacking all the exegetical stuff and trying to make a case for what's going on in Corinth, and um, that reflects its author because I think Gibbs is the primary author of this one. And so he, he, he did the, the yeoman's work on this. Then, of course, the, the committee gets a hold of it and does what they want with it, so you can't blame him for everything. But um, he's, he's the one doing primarily the, the exegetical stuff. And I, and I would say I don't have a big quarrel with the exegetical moves that he's making. I think he's on track. Now, you can start arguing about, wait a minute, this nuance of this verb and what's going on there and this kind of thing. And was that, is that the exact intention of Paul there? I don't know. I think the general the sense that comes out of this is, is unity a cri critical issue for the celebration of the sacrament for Paul? And is there anybody going to have, anybody ready to dispute that? 
No. So unity matters to Paul. Now, in Corinth, the problem with the disunity is not doctrinal. It's practical. It's you've got the rich and the poor having separated. You've got this click thing going on, and Corinth is exposing all their problems one more time. Right. Well, I mean, I got that, and that was very clearly stated in the right. show. Um, right. And the context is well delivered. And I, I think it's good exegetically there. But my right. question is, uh, does this document seem to just be assuming that Paul was uh, referring to the Eucharist? Does it actually? Because I didn't seem to find the Oh, the, the, the right, and, discerning the body? Yeah, I mean, that What body we mean? Him. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm quite content saying it's a double level thing. So the body, what body does God want you to recognize? I think both. Yeah. The Christ's body in the, in the host and then the body of everybody else at the altar with me, which is precisely where I want to go this whole time. That was the synecticity part. Yes. Uh, and I caught that. Yes. Uh, I guess my confusion was just the assumption that it was uh, a sacrament. It just, and I mean, I believe he was referring to the sacrament. Yeah. I guess in the document, I just didn't quite catch how they... Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things where you just kind of say, hey, I think this is what this means. Okay. It's probably an assertion more than anything. Because, and it, it's going to be context, it's going to be what Paul's doing, and then you start asking the question, is this consistent with the Paulian way of operating? And Paul with this kind of double entendre, that's, that's Paul. I mean, uh, he flips out a phrase which can be read two ways. I think it's intentional. So in other words... I'm, I'm a big fan of what I would call this intentional ambiguity. And I know that drives some exegetes nuts, but I, other exegetes kind of eat it up, and I kind of like it too. So Paul's not trying to pin it down to one thing. He wants it to be, read it the way you need to read it. And so it goes both ways. So it's the sacrament, but it's also the, um, the church itself. So which one is the body? It's the bread as the body of Christ, but it's in also the body as in the fellowship. It's both things. And so if you're not recognizing both, Big, big trouble, okay? All right. Now, <laughs> the discussion here, of course, then, is all about practice of who comes to the rail. And there are lots of questions. To get. We've already touched on some of this, like infant communion, I'm ruling out. Communion of people who can't examine themselves, I would rule that out, which is not irrelevant to this discussion. But there are several things going on in this document, and I'm, of course, more interested in hitting it from a systematic standpoint, so that's what I want to do. So I want to lay out some kind of basic fundamental ideas here to you that kind of sort of guide stuff that we can address some questions, okay? Now, first thing that comes through here is, one, I think one of the more helpful moves in this document is when they make a distinction between thinking about a person who is coming to the rail, and so thinking of a person in two ways. We think of the person as an individual, and we think of the person as a confessor. And the document brings this out a couple different times and uses this pretty well, but in, I, I'm one who likes things to kind of really be spelled out and made as crystal so clear as possible. I think this can be more crisply applied. So I want to do this because I think this is a very helpful insight. So in other words, when a person is coming to the rail, we want to think of him as an individual. He's an individual who has been paid, has since been paid for by Christ, but who's also supposed to be following Christ. So the question to ask is, is this individual worthy to be receiving the body and blood of Christ? And then that word worthy comes into play, and this really gets people fired up because worthy sounds like a judgment call about somebody's value. But what does worthy mean? Worthy means repentant baptized, recognizing Christ's forgiveness delivered, that makes me worthy. And in fact, where does this word come from? Small catechism. This is Luther's word. And Luther, in the small catechism, brings up this word because in his context, this was the big issue. Who can come to the sacrament? Well, you're only worthy if you have fasted, if you've been to the priest and done confession, if you've done this, if you've done this. You had a whole list a whole checklist to make you worthy. And that's why, what does Paul, Luther say? That one is worthy who believes and trusts the promise. That's enough. So Luther just cuts through all the checklist garbage. Whoops, done. What makes you worthy? Faith. Trusting the promise. Now you're worthy. So that's the why the word worthy. And when you hear the word worthy, it's not a judgment call on the person. It's a judgment call on, does this person know us the body and blood of Christ? Are they repentant of their sins? Are they ready to receive this for the forgiveness of their sins? If it's yes, 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 they are a worthy recipient. Okay? Now, the worthiness then is really dealing with the relationship of the person, quorum Deo, isn't it? Where does this person stand with God? Are they repentant? Are they trusting his promise? 
Are they ready to receive His gifts? It's all about the vertical relationship. So worthiness, thinking about the person as an individual, is the question of, is he ready to come to the altar? That's what's going on there. Now the other aspect, though, is this person who comes to the altar is also a confessor. He is confessing his faith. He is confessing a confession, a way of thinking about God, and he is confessing by coming to the altar. And in fact, the implication that is being drawn for the document, and I think this is right, is that to come to the altar is to join in the confession of that place. So when I commune at an altar, I am saying I am in unity with this confession. This confession at this altar is my confession. That's what you're saying. And so here, the question is not whether the person is worthy. The question is, is this person appropriate at this celebration? Does he belong at this altar? Is he part of this community of faith? Is he part of this gathering, part of the church in this place? That's the question. And if he is part of the church in this place, and he is confessing with the people in this place, he's appropriate. He belongs there. Now, this, of course, is dealing with what relationship? The coral mundo. It's dealing with the horizontal aspect. Me and everybody else. Am I in agreement with those who are, conf- who are with me at the rail? Am I confessing with them? Are they confessing with me? That's the Coromundo aspect. And what the document is pointing out is, which of these is Paul concerned with? Both. Both. That's why when we say you need to discern the body, it's not just a sacramental presence, it's also the horizontal presence. And sometimes people think that if I emphasize the body as the fellowship, I'm kind of diminishing the, the import, import of it. Actually, no, I'm getting the full blast the way it needs to be. Both matter. Because the body part is dealing with the quorum mundo thing, and the sacramental presence of the gift is really dealing with the quorum deo. What are you getting thing? Both matter. Both are important. And so this is the kind of the critical first step in starting to get this thing straight. So that's the first thing I want to stress is the individual confessor thing. Now, most people in our circles, when they start talking about communion practice and who should come to the rail, are pretty good about paying attention to this one, but almost completely ignore this part. And that's where a lot of the problems come. Because they'll look at Aunt Matilda, who shows up on Christmas Eve, and Aunt Matilda grew up in the congregation. And she was confirmed. And then she got married and she moved out west, and now she's going to a Methodist church, but it's only because Uncle Jim takes her to the Methodist church, but Aunt Matilda's still really a Lutheran in her heart, and she knows it's really the body and blood, and she believes all that stuff. But she, now she's a member of the Methodist church. So, Aunt Matilda shows up and, wants, and she thinks she can take communion. Is she a worthy recipient? Yes. Yes. Is she appropriate? No. This is the problem. And see, people get really concerned when they are saying no to somebody who is a good Christian and who believes the right stuff, but why can't she come then? Who am I to judge? This isn't right. She should be able to come and forget God's grace because she's really part of us. Well, you see, she's not because she has aligned her confession with a different confession. She's heterodox, whether she thinks she is or not, because that church where she worships is her confession. By virtue of that's where I worship, this is the congregation that has authority over me, this is the pastor to whom I'm accountable, this is my confession, even though I don't believe it. And the same thing works in reverse order. People in your pews are confessing with you even if they don't know everything that you're teaching them. So when you have a parishioner who is a flaming dispensationalist, a few more weeks and we'll get to that, and yet he's confessing because he's part of your congregation, You say, wait, he's heterodox. Well, no, he's part of my confession. He hasn't been taught yet, but he will. And when he gets taught the truth about dispensationalism, what will his response be? Oh, I didn't know that's what I believed. Okay, I'm cool with that. We're all fine. But if his response is, what? That's what we believe? I don't believe that. Well, then he's going to distance himself. He's not part of our fellowship. So in other words, this confessional integrity, the person that's a confessor holds. It does matter. And it's not a matter of what's in your heart as much as what are you confessing by your community of where you're worshiping. This becomes important. And when you commune, you commune with those who are with you. So you tell Aunt Matilda, Aunt Matilda, you're a fine lady. 
and you understand the sacrament well, I'm confused why you would go to a Methodist church where you're diminishing the reality of Christ. That doesn't make any sense. And the problem is, your confession now is a little bit muddled. And so, for the sake of clarity and, being, and integrity, it's really not honest for you to commune with us when we're not really in agreement, is it? Now, you can be a lot nicer about it and be kind and everything, but that's the bottom line. And that's the twofold aspect of this. And as I said, in our circles, people are pretty cool with this one, but have a lot more trouble swallowing and accepting this one. But they're both legit, and they're both critical to Paul's argument. That's the whole point of the, of the document. That's what Paul's up to with is, you better discern the body here, and you can't let disunity come into play. And does doctrinal disunity matter? Yeah, it matters. All right, now we've got a few questions here. So I'll go ahead and field this first round of questions. So Luke. What about the churches that don't really have a unified confession? That they are very non-denominational, just, oh, you know, whatever you believe yeah. is good, and that's what we confess that... That as long as you yeah. confess something, you're good. So you mean you have a, somebody who goes to that church and now shows up in your church and wants to take communion? Well, the fact is they don't have a confession. They need to get it figured out. And so what you do with them, now we're getting into peace stuff. But now you do, you're, you're approaching them to something like, wow, I'm so glad you want to come to communion with us and you want to receive Christ's body and blood. Now you realize when you come to the altar, you're saying you confess everything we confess. You probably don't even know everything we teach yet, so maybe we should get that covered first. I would like you to know what's going on, and I can't wait for the day for you to come in, but we've got to do some conversations first, and let's get moving that direction. This is going to be awesome. So in other words, you're not like, dude, you're not good enough for me. I, I don't want you. That's, you, don't mean, you don't even need to be a jerk about it, but you do want to create the sense of, this is great. I can't wait. I want you to commune with us, but we've got to get some ground covered here first because they don't have a confession, and they need one. And this thing that made me think of this is in the document they talk about people don't even know what it really means to join right. a church anymore. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, and see, to me, I'm not that even hung up on that. I, to me, it's not a matter of where's your name on the roll. The, the, really, the issue is who's, whose authority are you willing to submit to? Who's your pastor? And if my pastor, because my, by default, this is where I worship, this pastor has, has, holds me accountable, that's my confession. That's where I'm aligned. And I don't care if my name's on the list or not. And I see, I play that both directions. So if somebody starts coming to my congregation and starts worshiping at my congregation, and essentially, I'm to the point where as his pastor, I could go to him and say, dude, straighten up, you're not doing things right. And he would yield to that and follow my authority. He's part of my flock. And I'm not too concerned about, has he signed on yet? Has he got his box of envelopes yet? I'm, I'm less concerned about that than I am about, is he listening to my authority? And is he confessing with me? So I might invite him to the rail sooner than official membership. You get see, see where I'm coming from? Yeah, they, and they talk about it as far as the authority part, too. Yeah, that's, that's the critical thing. All right, Chris. Uh, so, when, so that's, in this case, coming to the rail, then regardless, even if you are a member of a different church or stuff, you'd rather, even if they were to come up with their arms kind of crossed, you know, like St. Andrew's cross over your chest, uh -huh. to receive a blessing, you know, is if they don't share that confession, uh, I mean, because isn't that isn't supposed to be a partaking in unity, even if they're not receiving? Yeah, but see, the, the, the distinction is the means of grace become the definitive things. That's why we talk about altar and pulpit fellowship, and we're not alone in this. So that's why we don't jump into someone else's pulpit or come to the rail. But to pray with them, we're fine with that. And to recognize the una sancta that transcends time and space and even transcends bad confession, we recognize that. So Aunt Matilda is a brother or sister in Christ, and if she wants to come to the rail, and I'll give her any blessing she wants. But what's a blessing anyway besides just a little prayer on the on your head, you know? And so, it's it's really it's really not much. And I, I frankly, I've never been really I'm not, I've never been able to understand why churches encourage that so much. It's like. Oh, you give me a little prayer, whatever. I'd rather have the body and blood. If I can't get that, I think I'll just stay in the pew. Thank you very much. You know, that's kind of been my attitude, but maybe I'm just weird about that. So I just don't, I don't see the, the great advantage of giving a blessing, frankly. Make, if it's like, a, here, you can't have the body and blood, but here's a little leftover for you. You know, reliquary. Wait, wait till after the sacrament. Maybe you have some leftovers. <laughs> All right, who's up? Adam. Um... To what extent and to what confession do they have to hold? Yeah, everything. Every, so every, nothing. every little point in well, of course. the when somebody, concord, when, every little when point some, in confession. When somebody joins the congregation, what do they say? I believe the teaching of this congregation, as I've learned to know from the small catechism. That's what they say. The That's what we usually hold them to. Okay. Yeah. Because our parishioners don't subscribe to the Book of Concord. Right. You do. Well, you will. 
two years. You got two years of freedom. Enjoy it. Live it up. <laughs> say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. But then AC 14 kicks in and you're, you're stuck, dude. This is why we don't ordain you before vicarage, because you're going to be able to violate all kinds of AC 14 things. We won't talk about that. <laughs> Can I extend my vicarage over a few years? <laughs> the system's four. The system's four. I could have been mistaken about this, but I thought I detected um, in the document kind of um, that the confessor, the individual as a confessor, is also in coming to the altar, um, putting their confession, um, in a sense, under that of the, the church their community. That's right. Um, so can you flip it around and, and say, would your pastor be comfortable with, with you Certainly. representing the church and saying that everything... Um, your church is in agreement with our church. Yeah, you can do that. The problem is you're probably going to have a lot of persons who say, I know my pastor, he's got no problem with that. You know, because you've got such, you know, the kind of ecumenical drive is so thick among, in some places that it's not going to be, that's not going to have that much teeth. But no, that's, that's exactly right. And see, that's, this is also within, so the reciprocity is fair in all this. So if I go to another congregation, do I, and I say, well, I'm at a Catholic church, I know it's really the body and blood, I can take the sacrament here, I'll get it. But in fact, by communing here, I'm making a statement of my union with them, which is really not quite genuine. Well, they shouldn't give it to you anyways. What's that? They shouldn't. They shouldn't. Give it to you. They should. That's right. I, I guess I'm wondering about it both for the visitor and in part to educate your own people. Right. And because that's where maybe I see it being more useful. This is, this, is the, this is the most important thing in all this, is the education of your people so they know what's going on and why. And so that's why I'm stressing this, this twofold aspect. So you're wanting to think about the Coram Deo stuff and the Coram Mundo stuff. So not only, and see this helps on so many levels. So not only am I just communing with Jesus, but I'm communing with everybody else too. And so teaching this is so important because when your people start to get it, then the consistency in our teaching starts to make a lot more sense. And I, I do believe that a lot of people take a huge offense over closed communion. And by the way, that's another point I was going to make. It is closed communion and not close communion. Um, somewhere in the late 20th century, somebody had the brilliant idea of saying, you know, closed sounds so mean and closed. And so let's talk about it being close instead. And you'll have some people who will really get really worked up about this. Like, and you'll talk about closed communion. Well, wait, wait, it's close communion. And just smile at them and say, whatever. Because um, here's the difference. If it's close, that means we're all close in our confession. It's close to us. That means if somebody is not part of our confession, guess what? It's closed to him. And so this is a semantic difference. There's no difference at all. And the traditional term has always been closed. And you look at the practice of the early church. What did they do when they got ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper? Remember we had the didache? To the doors. Out. Everybody out. Out, out, out. Communicants or confirmants, out, out. None of you around, okay? Now, everybody here? Good. Now let's celebrate the sacrament. So that's, that's closed, okay? Closed doors. That's the tradition. And so we're not aberrant or weird on this kind of a thing. But we need to teach this stuff because people don't get this. And they think about, oh, who's worthy? If somebody believes it's the body and blood and they're repentant, they're worthy. Commune them. And they're totally, totally negating the Coram Mundo aspect and the confessor aspect and all the horizontal aspect. And the cool thing is, a lot of your younger generations are kind of getting this because it's very postmodern to emphasize the community and the, the unity that we have together. And so when you emphasize the community aspect, it's not nearly so nasty to tell somebody, you know, you're not really part of our community yet. And so it's really inappropriate for you to commune already until you're really part of things around here. That's how I would approach it. So it, doesn't, it isn't quite so um, nasty or standoffish sounding. All right? Who's next? Brett. I just I think if you could have answered the last few questions, but does this paradigm shift at all uh, when it's a private communion? Like if you're in the hospital with someone one-on-one, -on -one, does this stay the same because you're kind of bringing the confession <coughs> to the church with you? Yeah, you really are. You're still, you're still always a confessor, whether you're one-on-one -on -one or not. And that, that's always going to hold. And so, yeah, it, it doesn't really, the rules don't change, the rules. It's not really rules, it's just that the practice doesn't change because the, the realities are still there, still the same. Okay, good. All right, got that done. So, we're talking about the closed aspect. Now, the other thing I want to get into here is, whose decision is it? And this is, um, one of the concerns I have on this is, very often in our practice, we act like it's up to the person who's sitting in the pew to decide whether or not they should commune. Okay? And so we, we um, put a statement in the bulletin that says, 
I believe that Jesus is truly my Lord and Savior. I believe he's present with his body and blood. I tend to repent of my sins and amend my sinful life. And if you say yes to all these things, come on up. Okay? Well, who's making the decision then? The person in the pew is. The person in the pew is making the decision. But who's responsible for the celebration of the sacrament? The celebrant is. The congregation is. And the congregation's pastor is the one who's immediately responsible. And in fact, depending on how you read the text in Acts, when Paul's talking to the elders, the bishops, the presbyter, the episcopus, in Ephesus he says, God has made you stewards of the mysteries of God. So that means you are responsible for the conduct of the mysteries of God, the gospel, the proclamation, the sacraments. You're responsible for this. So the decision doesn't belong to the guy in the pew. The decision belongs to the congregation. It's their call on who comes to the sacrament. And see, now what we're really up against here now is the whole Western American idea of my individual rights. I am a Christian. I have a right to Jesus' body and blood whenever I go to the Lord's Supper. And whenever I go to church, it's my right. No, it's not. No, it's not. The sacrament is the celebration of that congregation's unity. If you are a guest in somebody else's church, you're a guest. You don't just go running up to the table and say, give me my share. You need to be invited. And you're invited at the discretion of the host. And the host is the pastor and the congregation. They're the ones who will invite you if they would like you to participate. It's their call. And see, this is a whole different way of thinking about this that I think we should be cultivating our people. And this gets back to Kyle's point about teaching. One of the things to teach your people is this sense of not entitlement, but a sense of you know, responsibility in my congregation and a responsibility to honor the other congregations and their practices. So if I'm on vacation and I'm going to a congregation and I want to and they're go to church some Sunday morning, they're celebrating the sacrament, do I just assume I can run on up there? You know, get out my LCMS official card, look, I'm cool? No. I have a responsibility to talk to the pastor and see if it's okay and get his permission. Not to tell him I'm coming, but to ask him if it would be all right. It's his decision. And if he doesn't know who I am, he says, I don't know if I want to communion. Fine. Fine. I'll just go worship and that's cool. That's his call. And I don't get all bent out of shape that, who are you to deny me? Well, he's the pastor in that place. That's, of course, why. It's his responsibility. And so that's, that's what's appropriate. So, and we need to cultivate this kind of thinking because it's the decision belongs to the congregation and that congregation's pastor. And that starts to shift how we think about this and even then how we start to practice this. this is, I think this is significant. Coleman. Um. It's more a polity, I guess, question. Or, I mean, is that when you say it's the decision of the congregation, is that the, it's the decision of like the constitution that the congregation has come up with, or does it is that all still like handed over to the pastor as? It's going to depend a little bit on the situation and how it's going to be conducted. But you see, I think it becomes, if the pastor's functioning the right way, he's going to be teaching his people and bringing them along. And so the whole congregation is going to develop, in a sense, a, a culture of understanding of what the sacrament is and how we celebrate it and why and who is appropriate there. They're just going to know. And so then you get the thing where Aunt Matilda shows up and who's going to take care of Aunt Matilda wanting to come to communion? Her family members. They're the ones who are going to talk to her and say, Aunt Matilda, you're just not a appropriate anymore. <laughs> Sorry. And the pastor won't even have to deal with it because it'll be covered because it's part of the culture. And so the whole congregation has that responsibility, but fundamentally, ultimately, it is the pastor who is the called shepherd. He's responsible for what's going on there. And I would argue that God holds him accountable for that. It's part of your accountability. And vicar doesn't have that problem. It's a delicious thing about being a vicar. You get to play pastor for a year with no responsibility. So yeah, I agree with you, Alex. Let it go on for about three or four years. It's just it's the best year of your life. All the fun, none of the, none of the responsibility. And you get to say over and over again, I'll check with the pastor about that. That's not my decision. All right, Luke. In terms of once they're already at the altar, you know, they didn't talk mm -hmm. to you, you think that they're possibly all CMS, but you really don't know. Yeah. Do you go ahead and withhold and just you, display got, it after the fact? That's your pastoral discretion. It needs to kick in now. So now you can decide. So do I have a conversation here at the rail? And you might, you know, depending on the context, what your people are used to, what's kind of going on, you might say, hi, who are you? <laughs> uh, do you have any business being here? 
you know, says, yeah, sorry, I should have talked to you before, you know, whatever. And then you might go ahead and commune him. Or he might look at you like, I have no clue what's going on. And you say, well, we need to talk. Let me give you God's blessing right now. We're going to talk some more after the service. Or you might, because of the context, and people would be like freaked out if you did something like that, you might commune him. And then, and put the best construction on it. But then, as soon as the service is over, like in the last verse of the last hymn, you're tracking the guy down. And you're going to say, hey, met you at the altar. Who are you? <laughs> what are you doing there? And you find out. And it turns out he's communing, and he's, you know, he's a member of a LCMS congregation. And see, LCMS, by the way, is not the green card. It's just the quickest way to find out, is he in unity of our confession? Okay? And it's not the ultimate end all. And people get all of a sudden, well, it's either LCMS or nothing. No, it's confessional unity or nothing. And the quickest way to find out about confessional unity is to ask about their church membership. So you find out he's LCMS. You say, well, you know, I would really appreciate you letting me know that ahead of time. And if it turns out he's not, you say, hey, you know, um, Communion today, and that's kind of a serious thing around here. It's kind of a big deal. And um, I would really like to talk to you some more before we do that again. Um, when can I meet with you? And you set it up right then, and, you, and you're, you're ready. To, you're turning them into evangelism contact now, and you know, off you go. That's, that probably be how I would handle it. Either one of those would be, I think, is legit. Yeah, Julian. I was wondering how this can, can work in, in huge congregations, yeah. right? Where you've got, like... Yeah, like four stations, right. and, you know, the, the, the cell yeah. is not at all places. Right. And, yeah. And no, I'm with you. And I get this question all the time because I teach this to um, the SMP guys. And in fact, I wrote a paper that, uh, you know, getting into this stuff a little bit more, and I hand, do that with the SMP guys. And um, they always ask about that because about half of them come from these big congregations. And my response is, I really do believe that the pastor of the congregation should be able to know everybody at the rail. He's responsible. And if the congregation is so large that he doesn't know every face coming up there, it's too large. And it's time for him to start a daughter congregation and let somebody else be responsible for half of them. I mean, it's just too big. So I'm not, frankly, I'm not fond of these mega congregations. I don't think it's the old goal. And if you do have some kind of a mega congregation, then you need to have a plan worked out where the pastors in that place are going to be responsible for people and know what's going on and be able to check with each other about what's happening. And I've even suggested, and I think this is not out of the question, that if I'm the pastor and I'm the celebrant, maybe I don't even distribute the sacrament to my people. I'll have other people assisting, you know, giving the bread and wine, but I am watching who's coming up to the rail, and in a sense, I am admitting them to the rail by watching and saying, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, I see all that's going on, all these four places. Wait, I don't know that guy. I think I'll go down there and see what's going on. See, I think that'd be appropriate. That's how I would tend to look at it. Now, I know that's going to be like, that's dumb, but to me, it fits the whole idea of this a whole lot better. And the idea of the sense of we're responsible, we're taking this seriously. And my suspicion is a lot of the congregations that are, hey, we're huge, it's, we're just too big, probably aren't taking it nearly seriously enough. And that'd be my concern. And I would challenge some of their doctrinal assumptions at work there. All right, Brian. Are you, are you saying like at a rail you just like skip over them or? Do what? Would you just skip over them? Somebody I don't know? Let's get back to Luke's question. Then you have to decide. You know, benefit of the doubt, find out what's going on as soon as the service is over, or maybe I just give them the blessing and find out what's going on. You have to make the call, and it's going to be a judgment call as you, as you as the pastor. I, I, I've been to congregations where the elders will, like, that haven't recognized me, ask me. Yeah. And they ask me, like, basically, what are you doing here? Yeah. I'm like, well, I, like, I don't worry. Like, I'm, I go to... Seven or eight samples. Like I can take them. That takes care of everything. They're like, oh, they're like, oh, oh, oh. oh. Here, here's two. Here's two. <laughs> you get extra. <laughs> I, 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 I always saw that as, as off putting as that may be. That might be the best way to do it is have. No, I think so. Like, but see, that's why, that's why your best practice is to talk to the people before you go to the rail so you're not surprising them. But you know, I know that doesn't always happen. Um, Okay, that's fine. Next question. I was going to say something, I forgot it, but go ahead. Uh, right on Ryan's question is, uh, with uh, elders, just let's say you're in a church, even if you know it, everyone, if a visitor sneaks in at the last minute and you can't see them, yeah. uh, I mean, would it, could you delegate that authority to your elders to be discerning, especially since they might help you with that? Yes, definitely. This is part of the training. You teach your elders what's going on. This is part of, I'm talking about this, creating a culture of, this is how we do things around here. And you, and you educate and you teach about this. Um, so I know I remember what I was going to say this is also why if you are the pastor what do you take the cup or the bread the bread absolutely why because you are admitting them to the rail 
You're the one making the decision. And so when I, because I'm the one who's got the host, and as soon as I give him the bread, the guy who follows behind, he just does whatever I'm doing. So the, your elder is the one who just carries the wine around. And it doesn't have to be anything special about who's doing that, because you're the one admitting them to the rail. And that, and you know, you get some congregations where the people, the elders are like, oh, I'm afraid I'll spill the wine or something. And you know, this is, this is what it needs to happen. The elder is the one who is just bringing the wine along behind. Even better, if you have a small enough congregation, just you do both. Take your time and do them both. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you don't have to have an elder up there helping. So you're the one who admits them. And see, this is also, this ties into the church discipline issue that Julian brought up. So you could have some, a member of your congregation who's an appropriate member, but suppose he's impenitent. He's not worthy. And so who's going to decide whether he should be communed? You, the pastor, should. And that leads to the discussion of the minor ban. So let me go ahead, Chris, and we'll hit that. Well, I mean, I guess my question on it, though, was... Could you delegate that authority, though? I mean, you're if, as the celebrant, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of your authority to admit who comes to the altar. However, if you're also doing the bread as the pastor, uh, right. could you have your elders, since they're going to be in the back, all right. the way up to the last minute, could you have them kind of fill you in? That's exactly what I would have. So in other words, the, you know, somebody shows up at the rail, or even the elder comes up, you know, when you're getting ready for this distribution, and says, we got a visitor back there, he talked to me, we're, we're all cool. And I know, I'll trust my elder enough that he's been educated, he knows what makes somebody cool, and I'm good with that. So you're creating an atmosphere, you're creating a culture. So now I'll come back to the minor band here in a minute, but I want to just give one quick anecdote. I was in a congregation once, and I witnessed this firsthand, where you had a family that was visiting. They were obviously not members of the congregation. They were visiting that day, and they were sitting in a pew, and they're like mom and dad and some kids. And so the time for communion came. So the usher's going down, dismissing people by pews. You know, everybody's getting up and going. He comes to their pew, and they're like, no. You know, they're doing this kind of thing. I'm watching this. It's all pantomimes. You know, it's all kind of quiet in the distance. You know, it's like, no. And he's like, it's okay. And they're like, no, no, we're not ever saying that. He's like, okay. And he's like practically dragging them out of the altar. No, come on. You need to go. It's like, they have better sense than he does. And they get it. They're not part of this. They get it. And he was just totally out of line. You know, oh, of course. Hey, this is for everybody. This is good. We want you up there too. No, we don't. They got it right. You know, and, but somebody hadn't taught... The ushers, obviously, you know, and so this is something not just for the elders, but it's like all levels. The whole congregation needs to kind of get this and understand what's going on. Brian. Uh, my, my church is a really big church in Detroit. This is a uh, historic church, and we have uh, communion at Christmas and, and Easter and stuff, mm -hmm. but like a bunch of people come, right? Yeah. It's like Christ or heaven. They all come. And I'll never forget, I, I, I usually act like, and... Uh, we, we hold the basket for the little cups mm -hmm. to go by, and these girls are walking by, and they're holding, they're holding the cups, and they they, I, they hadn't drank it, and they go, yeah, so "What are you supposed to do with this?" And I look at them like, look very nice. Oh, you can just give it to me. You can. And my my brother and I are sitting there, and I, I give him one, and we just we just drink it. And I'm like, I can't. Fool. Like I I always had a really big problem that my church does yeah. you know yeah. on Christmas. Yeah. Because it's just like no, I know. It's, everyone get over here. Yeah. It's one of those things that drive you nuts when I mean, you see people like looking around. What do I do with this? Like, and you're like, oh, no. like well, I this know. Is great. I know. I know. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Alex. Um, so in this scenario, you brought up where you've got the, the family that's in the pew and they don't want to come up. So you know that this is probably not the right thing. But let's, I mean, hypothetically, you're let's say you're one of two pastors, and the other pastor didn't catch this. Yeah. He didn't see it. So he communes them, and then they go sit down. Uh -huh. So what do you do at that point? You go talk to the family. So after, after yeah. the service, go chat with them. Find out what's going on, what they are. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I would do it. All right. Yes. All right. Now, minor ban. What's the minor ban? The minor ban is, so we call this the minor ban in, a, in a conjunction with the major ban. The major ban is excommunication. So excommunication is, hey, you're not part of the fellowship, you're out of here. Just read 1 Corinthians 5, that's excommunication. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 5, a text which appears only once, two and a half verses in any other pericopal system, and that's only, we had this on Easter Sunday about being new leaven. But the whole context is actually about excommunication, about the dude who's got his father's wife. Eee, creepy. And so the, that's excommunication. That's the major ban. The minor ban is when a pastor as the shepherd has a sheep who says, Pastor, I got this situation I'm in, and I'm not ready to repent. Well, that's a serious, serious stuff. And so the point, at that point, the pastor would say to his prisoner, as long as you are in the state of impenitence, I will not commune you. That's the minor ban. 
The minor ban is when the pastor communicates to a parishioner, I will not commune you until you are out of this impenitent state. Until this is resolved, I won't commune you. The minor ban is the pastor's prerogative. He doesn't have to check with anybody. The elders don't give him permission. He's got the keys. And so when you're forbidding someone to come to the sacrament, it's like the minor ban, because you're not kicking them out of the church. You're not excommunicating them. You're not declaring them a sinner and a, and a heathen, but you're telling them they're on their way, and this is serious, serious business. That's, it. that's the minor ban. So that's another reason why the pastor is the one who admits the sacrament, because if the guy you put on the minor ban shows up on a Sunday morning, then your response would be, hey, we need to talk because I'm not going to commune you until we've, I've made this clear, we are not, I'm not communing until we have this straightened up. And you're showing up here doesn't mean you're repentant. It means we got to talk. And that's, that's the significance of the minor ban. So the minor ban is not something to be wielded, you know, like a little, I'm ticked off at you, minor ban. Or, you know, you didn't like my Bible class? Fine, you can't have communion. <laughs> you don't, that's, that's the tyranny that they're afraid of, Brian, okay? That's the tyranny that CTC Doctrine is afraid of, is that kind of thing happening. That's what they're afraid of. But the minor ban is the prerogative, and I would argue the responsibility of the pastor, as is appropriate, for the sake of the disciplining of sheep. Now, ideally, someone in the minor ban should not be on there for more than two or three weeks. It's gonna, you're going to be pursuing this, trying to get it settled. And if the guy ends up being totally resistant, then what's going to happen very shortly? The minor ban turns into active pursuit of church discipline, and he's going to be on his way towards full excommunication major ban. Everybody's going to get involved. The whole congregation dealing with the whole church discipline thing, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5. But other course might be the person says a week later, you're right, Pastor. I took care of that. I have I resolved that situation. I'm not doing it anymore. And the pastor's great. I'm so glad to hear it. You need to come to the rail right away. It was resolved. And no one's ever even heard about it. It's all great. The pastor's taking care of his sheep. All cool. That's how the minor ban works. And it's an appropriate part of this, and it's part of who comes to the rail and who doesn't. It kicks in, it plays a part here. Yeah, uh, if you go to a congregation that does have the stations, like one for each aisle, mm -hmm. is it okay to fill in your elders uh, about a minor ban? Yeah, you would have to, probably. You would have to. I mean, see, that's part of that discretion, which is unfortunate. You don't want to do that. But you might just say, if so-and-so shows up, um, don't commune them. I need to, I, you send them to me. And that's probably all you need to say. And if they want to know more, say, I'll, I'll let you know as I need to. You know, I, cause I'm, I'm really big on Eighth Commandment and protecting people and not s maliciously spreading more than they need to know. So I would keep, you, keep people in the dark as long as I can until they have to know something. Then you share what you need to share. Okay? Yeah, Kyle. In the context of a sin like um, just a generic addiction or something where somebody's <coughs> working with somebody to struggle, yeah. who's struggling with that and trying to get through it, and they're sorry for it on the one hand, right. but they also say something along the lines of, um, but I don't feel like I am strong enough yet to give that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is gonna be one of the most maddening things you'll deal with in your ministry, at least from my experience. I, you know, I had a handful of guys who were dealing with alcoholic issues or pornography issues, and it's like, oh man, you get sick of this. You know, how many times do I need to absolve you? And yeah, they come back, and what do you do when they're repentant? What do you have to do? Absolve them. And you take them at face value. Some of you said before, when we talk about absolution, you take them at face value. If somebody says, I'm sorry, Pastor, you got to forgive them. And one of the hardest things you'll find yourself having to do is absolve the guy for the 18th time. And you know, you're thinking, you're just lying through your teeth, dude. I forgive you all your sins. Um, but see, that's what you have to do. You're the pastor. And so I would say in that case, you continue to offer him the gospel and you help him with his weakness because his weakness is very human. The, the minor ban really probably applies much more to the kind of intransient, deliberate wickedness where, yeah, I'm shacking up with my girlfriend. I don't give a rip. We're both real happy. Leave me the heck alone. That's a little different than I'm struggling with this. I think I'm going to fall off the wagon next week, but I'm really working on it. That's very different. Okay, because I would say minor ban and the next communication actually really applies only to the kind of willfully, deliberately, intentionally disobedient to God's will. And you'll know them when you see them. Okay, Brian. I think churches are too afraid to do minor ban. Oh, absolutely. They're afraid of the whole church discipline thing. It's one of the weirdest things. The CTCR has a really nice document from 1985 on church discipline, and it lays it all out, crystal clear, boom, solid, done deal. And it's only like about 20 pages. What do you say? There's not much to say about it. It's all straightforward. It's only 20 Who's pages. doing it? Yeah. We well, should read it then. Well, yeah. Wow. Well, it, it's not apropos for this. It could be for this class, I suppose, but I save it for another one. But um, it's, it's, um, it's a solid document, I think. But is it practiced? No. 
And there's all kinds of reasons. And we'll get into some of those reasons actually next week, because one of the big reasons is log loss reductionism. I, I had a relative who got, who got excommunicated, and they skipped, this, they skipped it. Yeah. Oh, the, this part of it, you mean? Yeah, I'll see, that's, that's the other problem. That's one of the reasons why the CTCR document is worried about this abuse of tyranny kind of thing. So that kind of stuff. Chris? So <clears throat> one of the, those rare, you know, God forbid, in case we have to do a major ban. Yeah. Uh, I mean, clearly you can't call up every church and say this guy's banned. You know, no. they can just run off to another church. And that's one word. of the definite liabilities that happens today. But, and, it's, and hopefully your LCMS brothers will not welcome them with open arms, but even I know that happens. But the reality is that they can go to another church. My, my rejoinder to that is, but at least you've delivered God's truth to them. And the warning from the prophet who's been faithful will stick in that guy's craw, and he might be able to happily join another church, but somewhere down inside he knows, wait a minute, I was excommunicated. And you wait, the, you trust the Holy Spirit to do his work. And if, if let's say that person, you know, 40 years down the line returns, you know, yeah. and then you can just bring it right back in. Uh, I've seen that happen. I've seen people who, decades after an excommunication, come back and they want to get it cleared up because it has not, they've not been able to forget about it. So yeah, it's, and that, that's kind of cool. All right, now one last quick word on the individual cups versus common cup. Um, do individual cups work? Yes. Are they good? No. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> No, individual cups just kind of stink, mostly because it's this little plastic throwaway Jesus. I mean, the little shot glass Jesus, and we just think, and the one, one sounds I hate the worst is the sound of a plastic cup dropping into a bucket, tonk, in a church service. I just hate that. It makes me cringe. And so, anyway, the, the common cup is far more reverent, far more you know, appropriate and has the symbolism with it, but yeah, it's not required. Um, there needs to be a fair amount of education here too, because people get all worried about getting cooties from the common cup, which is silly on so many levels. You don't get sick from what you drink, you get sick from sticking your finger in your nose after you're shaking somebody's hand. That makes you sick. <laughs> and so, you know, we need to educate people about the germs that are really on the cup, which are minimal, and you got a little alcohol in there and, and precious metals, and it makes it even fewer live viruses. So we just need to do a little more educating with people, and I would love to see a better revival of the common cup, but that, maybe that'll happen too. So.